want to make sure you can still hear me out there. I think I did a mute error. That's okay. We're going to go ahead and keep going. So welcome to Alpha Live, where we bring you access to connect with leaders across the country who are making a positive impact in our communities. And today's topic is teaching to lead the change you want to see. And our special guest is the CEO of Teach for America, Elisa Villanueva Beard. Now, before we start, let's take a look and learn about how change happens. Teach for America is a collective force of educators and leaders who are expanding opportunity for all children. We are committed to creating an education system that lets every child reach their potential. But where do we start? We start when a new teacher walks into a classroom. Let's say that teacher is you. You are anxious. This may be the hardest thing you've ever done, but you know this. Education is perhaps the greatest purpose there is. Because everything else, opportunity, progress, freedom, begins with education. You know that every child in that classroom is going to come to you with different needs and gifts and obstacles. And whether you teach 10 or 30 or 120 120 children, children. it's your job to do right by all your students every single day for two full years. And as you move through those years, you're learning from your peers and listening to parents, celebrating milestones, morning tragedies, it's quinceañeras and sweet 16s, chorus after school sports and student council elections. And with hard work, your students are succeeding academically. They're developing as learners, leaders, and advocates for themselves in pursuit of their goals. And at the end of two years, you are also very, very different. Now, you're wondering how you can continue to make an impact on your students' lives. You keep teaching, get a graduate degree, take on a role in the administration of your school. You serve on the school board for the district, then the state. And your impact grows because you keep drawing on what you learned in that first classroom. Fast forward over several decades. Look around at the community you became a part of. Some of you are educators, innovators, state chiefs of education, reimagining schools and school systems to deliver educational excellence for all kids. Some of you are culture makers, leaders in local, state, and federal government, doctors, lawyers, and other professionals who vote, advocate, and organize for more equitable policies. You form a network that collectively touches every dimension of the educational experience of children in your community and across this country. We are not just making a two-year bet. We're making a lifetime bet on our core members, on the alumni they become, and on the world they're shaping. Dr. King once said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Our work is to find, develop, and support people who are ready to bend that arc of the moral universe alongside their students. It starts with a leader who walks into a classroom, bears witness to the potential of all children, and becomes their advocate for life. It is a privilege to have the CEO, Elisa Villanueva Baird, the CEO for Teach for America. Uh, Elisa, I'm going to go ahead and give a little bio intro for you um, so that everybody knows who you are. Uh, now, Elisa's passion for education equality comes from personal experience. She grew up in the Rio Grande Valley of South Texas and developed a deep commitment to Teach for America's mission as a student at DePaul University, where she was one of just a few Mexican American students. Her journey with Teach for America started as a 1998 Phoenix Corp member. Elisa joined staff in 2001 to lead the organization's work in her hometown as executive director of the Rio Grande Valley region. Four years later, she became chief operating officer, leading Teach for America's field operations as the organization expanded from 22 to 48 regions, growing its network from 12,500 to more than 43,000 leaders in 2013 while improving student outcomes each and every year. In 2015, Elisa became Chief Executive Officer of Teach for America. Today, under her leadership, Teach for America Corps members reach hundreds of thousands of students each and every year, nearly 2,000 schools across 37 states and the District of Columbia. Teach for America Network is more than 66,000 leaders strong. 
and is working in every sector to ensure that children have the access and opportunity to reach their full potential and achieve their dreams. Elisa holds a BA in sociology from DePaul University. She sits on the boards of Holdsworth Center, City Fund, and Leadership for Educational Equality, and on the advisory board for the AT&T Aspire Accelerator. And in 2021, she was introduced as one of Alpha's most 50 most powerful Latinas list. Elisa lives in Houston with her husband, Jeremy, and their four sons. Elisa, thank you so much for being with us here today and talking about the topic of teaching to lead the change you want to see. Now, I just read your bio, but can you tell us a little bit more about yourself that maybe people won't know based on what I just read? Sure. First of all, Damien, thank you so much for having me. It's a true honor to be in conversation and, and have this discussion. Um, I'm happy to share a little bit more about myself. I'll say foundational to who I am is where I come from, beginning with my family, my parents in particular. And so I'll share that my mom came to the United States from Mexico at the age of 17 with a formal eighth grade education. Her first job, she earned 65 cents an hour. She likes to remind us often, and she was still able to save. <laughs> um, and so my mom, she turned her attention to love and marriage a few years after coming to Texas, which is where she, she first came. And when she started to explore what she wanted for her life, my mom had one requirement to getting married. She did not want a man with a house or a car or even a handsome face, she says, although that, that was a bonus. Um, she wanted to marry someone who had a college degree and it was her number one criteria. And so she was committed to that and, and she describes it as because she knew her kids' lives would be different if they had a dad with a college degree. So at the age of 23, my mother went on a blind date. She met Ramiro Villanueva who his family's also from Mexico, and Ramiro was a firefighter by night in order to pay for his school. And though he proposed and tried to marry my mom, Eva, a few times before he had his college degree, my mom said, no, until you get that college degree, am I going to marry you? Um, so Ramiro is my father, who's incredible, and they've been married for now almost 50 years, and they are my role models and you know are my heroes in, in this life. And, you know, so I say all of that because education was foundational to our family, faith, family, education, and my parents had very high expectations of us. And so, as you might expect, I was that kid that just did absolutely everything right in high school. I was an A plus student. I was student body president. I was even an all-star basketball player. I still have a mean um, jump shot, by the way. <laughs> um, <laughs> so I knew I was going to go to college. I never imagined I'd end up at DePaul University in Greencastle, Indiana, a world away from South Texas. But I did because I had a mentor, Mr. Disc, who you just took an interest in me. And my parents agreed to let me go, although they were not happy about it. And I was sure that when I got to DePaul that the toughest part of my experience or what was going to be toughest for me was the cultural, you know, culturally just being in a very different environment. I was truly a world away from, you know, my my hometown. And I did feel like fish out of, out of water a lot. Um, but and, and there were many times where I would stop and ask myself, you know, what in the world am I doing here? But that was not the hardest part. I, what I didn't expect is that I would come to experience feeling underprepared, not even feeling, like actually being underprepared for the rigors of college. So imagine being an A-plus student. I honestly still get knots in my stomach when I take myself back to being 18 years old on this campus that you know I'm so different than everyone else and I'm you know struggling mightily. I was used to getting all A, A pluses and I was working really hard, really disciplined for C's and D's. And it becomes quite traumatic for an 18 year old because you start to internalize like maybe I don't belong here. You know, may, maybe I'm not college material. I called my mom about three months into it and said, I don't think I'm going to make it. I'm literally doing everything I know how and I cannot have a breakthrough. And, you know, my mom listened for a minute and then just said, I'm sorry, this is so hard for you, but you're not welcome home until you get your degree from DePaul University. And at the time it was really harsh and really tough to hear. But as I've just, as I've talked about it with my parents since then, they a, knew I could do it. I mean, they just wouldn't accept that I couldn't. 
And then B, they somehow have the wisdom of knowing that whether I persisted in that moment or I went home, I'd learned different lessons about myself. And my parents somehow knew that me figuring out the path forward here, no matter how hard and almost impossible it felt, was going to be good for my life, my, the long term. And, and they were right and they were incredibly wise. And uh, I learned at 18 that the only way to get through a massive challenge is to literally keep walking. <laughs> and that's what I did. I learned to ask for help. By my sophomore year, I was thriving. I was doing incredibly well. And I um, then said, you know, I was on a path to be a lawyer. That's what I was going to do. And as I started to reflect on my first year, I actually got really outraged because I started to think I almost fell through the cracks and I had a lot, I had a lot of resources, you know, I had lots of help. I had my parents, I had so much. And I started to realize that so many kids do not, you know, make it through and they shouldn't have to, you know, if you're, if you're told you're prepared, then you need to be prepared and, and show up and, and be able to thrive. And so I learned about Teach for America um, my sophomore year in college, learned more my junior year. And what I saw was a group of people who were just really rejected the status quo, like rejected that where you happen to be born dictates your life outcomes in this country, which remains true today. And that brilliance is distributed equally across all lines of difference, all zip codes, and it's access and opportunity that locks people out. And we are committed to doing something different and have a different vision of what is possible to live into our aspirations as a country that we've said um, every American should have access to. And so that's what got me to join Teach for America. My mom was mortified. I told her that, you know, I'd be a lawyer one day, but <laughs> once I met my kids, my kids, you know, um, swept me off my feet. I, I saw their brilliance and I knew they were brilliant. I saw their determination and I also saw the deep inequities. And once you see that, you can't unsee it. And so I've committed my life to it. And here I am 23 years later. Um, and I've had various roles within the organization that have been in this one for about seven years. I, I So I love that entire, it was a love story. It was a challenge. Story. I could see that as a movie and all the ups and downs and everything that goes into it. Thank you so much. There is no way any bio could ever encompass what it was that has made you, you. And I thank you for sharing that with us. Um, and yeah. your point around teachers and the impact they have on, on students, I'll tell you, so I grew up in Harlem mm -hmm. and um, when my wife and I bought our, our house, we went to go pay taxes for the first time. And I never, you know, kind of dealt that before I show up, I'm paying my taxes and there's a lady next to me and um, we somehow start talking and I say, you know, it's my first house and, and it's, you know, exciting times and. And she says, you know, how, how proud she is, you know, just kind of me as a person. Um, and as she leaves, I say to them, I was like, I think that was my fifth grade teacher. Wow. From Harlem. I go running outside. I see her about to drive out. I, I jump in her car, in front of the car, like, hey. Um, I'm like, you know, are you so-and-so? She's like, yes, I'm like, did you teach in Harlem at this school? She's like, yes. And you can see the look on her face like, I was like, you taught me. Wow. And I talked to her about how much of an impact she had on me back then, things that I still think about today. And so to your point of the impact a teacher can make is so, um, it, it doesn't just, it's not just the moment, but it carries through, it, it carries through a lifetime. That's right. Um, as we talked about that, and you talked about some of the inequities that are happening right now, the pandemic, um, I would say further emphasize what some people weren't aware of in terms of some of the inequities that are out there. Um, can you talk to us a little bit more about what's your take on education today as we're recovering from the pandemic? Yeah, um, my take is very sobering, Damien. And I think it's really important and no doubt folks that are tuning in have different, you know, understandings or perhaps proximity to this because of, you know, family or friends or themselves, you know, being involved at various levels. But honestly, we are, we all have to be really rooted in understanding that we are in a massive inflection point. Um, this is a moment for a generation, for a country and the world and for our education system. 
And the reason that I say that is because, as you just said, you know, pre-COVID, things actually were not working for our kids. And so the inequities got, you know, there's a, a spotlight on them, yeah. but they've only grown since then. And this is a moment that is going to help us either, we're going to either step up or not for this generation of kids to have the opportunity to learn, lead, and thrive. And so just a few statistics, if we look at kids from, you know, um, low-income communities, they are, are they are now 13 months behind academically than their kids, the, than their affluent peers across this country. Um, and it is just because of how the pandemic impacted them. Schools were not, you know, didn't open for some time. The loss and the trauma and all the acute impact of the pandemic, you know, very directly on low-income communities played out. When we look at just reading benchmark for young readers, about a third of kids are not hitting, you know, what we would expect to be, you know, just the, the benchmarks that we need them to be on track in order to, by third grade, be reading proficiently. And we know that's a major mile marker. So that is a deep concern. And then we would be remiss to not make sure we're all just really grounded in the trauma and the loss that our kids witness. And it's intensified the mental health crisis that already existed pre-pandemic and has only gotten worse. Um, we've seen dramatic increases in you know, emergency room visits that are related to mental health, including suicide attempts. And so that's the reality of what is happening in our communities around the country. Um, but it's also an opportunity if we really understand it. I've never seen a better case for change than what we've experienced over the last two years. The system is outmoded. We very clearly see that the system was built over a, well over a hundred years ago for an industrial age, for a different purpose in what it was preparing our young people to do. And it wasn't, it, not all people had access to this um, education system. And that's how it was built and designed. We now live in a fundamentally different time. We live in a digital age, information age, we live in a global society. Our society is changing dramatically. And it's time for us to ask, what is the purpose of education and how to understand it? It takes a community to educate kids. I We saw that during the pandemic. And so this is also a moment to say, let's get on a different path and really figure out how do we reinvent an education system so the system is personalized where we're able to, you know, appropriately position teachers, reimagine really the role of the teacher, ensure they're valued and compensated appropriately, ensure that, you know, our kids' cultures and the wisdom they're bringing into schools and their incredible strengths are prioritized in how we educate our kids. And so that's the priority that, you know, that's the opportunity that we have in front of us if we grab it. And that is what we're really focused on as an organization ourselves as we meet the moment. And so for us, you know, this last two years, what it's meant is like really listening to our communities. What are the field facing problems, understanding our core strengths and how we can contribute. We started a tutoring program that's focused on accelerated learning and um, connection and belonging because of the lack of engagement for kids. And we've been able to, and we're focused on third grade reading and eighth grade math. And we are seeing incredible results today. We have over 500 tutors teaching across eight different communities, and we're going to scale that to 1,500 next year. We've also focused on doubling down on ensuring that we're able to attract, you know, really diverse um, teachers, racially, ethnically diverse teachers. We know that's really important. And given the big gaps in Black educators um, in particular and the legacy of institutional racism, we've started a Black Educator Promise Grant that is, you know, focused on recruiting and getting folks to stay in the classroom. And we've seen some incredible progress there. Um, and then further, the last thing I'll say is we've really focused a lot on ensuring that we're taking care of the mental wellness of our own teachers because teachers need to be taken care of for them to take care of their students. And so we provide free access to counseling and resources through BetterHelp. Um, and I ensure that all of our teachers are able to get the supports that they need. And so, with all of these things, there's a lot that we're doing to reimagine and really grab the moment and meet it. And really, it's going to take all of us to get there. Yeah. So, so, so th th you, there's a lot to unpack there too. I'm going to want to hit on a couple different pieces. Um, 
it sounds like, so have you changed some of the curriculum with respect to how you are preparing uh, teachers from a Teach for America standpoint to engage and, and connect with the students? Yeah, you know, we've always focused on relationships. You know, one of the things that I think is so interesting that folks came to realize during COVID is, you know, as you're doing virtual teaching, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, it's incredibly difficult to teach, period. Um, and then to do it virtually. We've always at TFA emphasized relationships. Like you can't teach kids who you don't know, who you don't love, who you don't connect with. Um, who there where there's not real trust. And so that's been a cornerstone of how we train and support our teachers. And we're like, there is no learning if there is no relationship. And so that we we really had a handle on and, you know, but still had to do it virtually, which we've never had to do. We had to create a whole new training, a training model. I mean, our, our model 30 years old is like in-person training. Yeah. And in a matter of 10 weeks had to switch to virtual. We did do things like add trauma-informed teaching, we were able to, um, you know, ensure that we were um, evolving our own curriculum around DEI and racial equity. And so we did make some of those shifts and then add, added, you know, a focus on mental health, you know, aligned to the trauma informed teaching piece of this. And so those were some of the adjustments that we made as a result of what we were in the middle of and wanting to ensure that we were preparing our teachers and supporting them to, to be able to thrive in the moment. No, that's that's fantastic. Now, so are there some of the pieces of the virtual world that you're thinking, yeah, we want to keep this moving forward? Like, you know, does it help with recruiting? Uh, are, are there certain parts that you say, yeah, we're going to keep this uh, even as we move forward? Yeah, we are definitely keeping um, the virtual training and induction of of into this into our effort as well as the training and and then some of the supports and really building it out. You know, we we're a network now of sixty six thousand, and we bring in you know thousands of teachers. We have thousands of teachers in our at one time who are teaching. And the thing that we are have pivoted to is ensuring that we're really taking advantage of that scale, which means optimizing for the for the ability for everyone to have a personalized experience and have access to best in class resources. The big thing we're working on right now is how to create a Peloton for teachers. So Peloton's super popular amongst folks. <laughs> and so imagine on-demand coaching, access to the best, you know, yeah. um, in-class assessments and resources. You know, you record yourself one day and say, I need feedback on my teaching practice and I'm going to, you know, um, engage in that and, and be able to get feedback right away. And so, and then having a robust community digitally um, is one of the things that we are focused on and think that it'll help us more effectively support our teachers, have them have access to each other. Um, and then while also being hyper local, I mean, this work is deeply human. Um, there are just some things you cannot do digitally. And so we're very self-aware of that. We're just being more discerning on what can you do digitally? And then what are the things you can prioritize that are require strong, you know, being rooted in culture, in connection with each other. And, you know, obviously teaching with children is, is a deeply uh, is, is is rooted in in relationship and trust that can only be built in person. Yeah, no, I, that's I love that. So, so um, digging a little bit more on the the teacher shortage that so I, I'm hearing a lot about it. Uh, I'm curious your thoughts. Um, it, you know, what is that looking like? Uh, what are some of the challenges to bridging the shortage that's there? Yeah. You know, I will say that we as a country are in a dire situation when it comes to our educators in both recruiting educators and retaining educators, just to give some specific data points. If you look at schools across the country that serve predominantly black and brown students, they're, they're, they are staffed at a 44% level right now. And that might be a little too high actually. But what that means is when you have schools that are fully staffed at 40, only 44% of our schools are fully staffed. That means kids are sitting in auditoriums for hours being babysat. It means that kids are not getting the learning that they need. And that is of deep concern. And, and, and I, I think things are gonna continue to just be harder. When you look at our top 500 districts in America in terms of population, the 500 largest, 37% of those superintendents have left their post in the last two years. And when you look at the data, the next 26% are saying, I'm gonna leave soon. So 
that's the reality. What's also true is that we have to now more than ever respond to that. And I look at a generation, Gen Z, who's incredible. They understand systemic inequity like no generation we've seen, you know, in terms of as we engage with, with um, young people. We also see a generation that is committed to want to drive change. It's the most gen most diverse generation of any generation. Um, and they are entrepreneurial and they want change. And that is a great advantage. And there is no better way to, you know, to make a difference. And I think no greater act of leadership than to teach. So this is the moment for us to inspire the next generation. And earlier you heard, you heard me talking about reinventing our education system. We need innovators and we need folks who are creative and we need the diversity of teachers that reflects our country to be coming in now more than ever. We need folks to say, we are going to be on the cutting edge of it. And this is the moment to do that. Um, and so that is what we are working with and really committed to doing and at TFA adjusting our own selves this year, we're spending over $10 million in stipends trying to get, make, you know, lower the entry to barrier for people to be able to pick teaching in this moment. Um, everyone who joins us gets a $5,000 stipend for their transitional uh, as a grant. Um, so they are able to use that before, you know, they get their first paycheck. And if you come from a low income community, you get $10,000 in that transitional period. And so we're doing things like that in order to lower the barriers and do whatever it's going to take to make this a viable solution because we need all hands on deck and we need every last leader who's like, I want to make a difference to pick teaching in this moment. So, Elisa, I think about the, the timing that we're having this conversation, which I think is perfect. You have a lot of college students about to graduate, Yeah. Um, some of which are, I know a lot of conversations I have with college students, some of them are doing the job they, they have as their major, but it isn't necessarily what's speaking to their heart of what they want to do. Um, is, is if, if someone's like, you know what? I, yes, they're watching. I, I want to do, I want to jump in this thing. Um, is it too late for this year? Can they still jump in and be a part of what's happening? Um, they can jump in. Uh, they can jump in. We are done with, with recruiting for this season, okay. but for next season, we start, you know, we're accepting applications right now for folks to commit to next year. Um, we also have ways to engage folks who want to get in like our tutoring program to just start to, you know, get a taste of what it is to teach and have a meaningful impact and, you know, and be able to get connected to the work. And so I would encourage folks to go on our website and check out, you know, how to get involved and, and, and how to apply. And you can apply right now for, for next season, um, www.teachforamerica.org. Nice. And so how have you seen the numbers for Teach for America? Have they increased over the pandemic, people wanting to get involved? Um, how does that look right now? Yeah, they have not increased. Um, they have decreased from last year, which is what we're seeing in all of our peer organizations. Um, and we're seeing folks really grapple with the question of, you know, how do I make this a workable, a workable way to, you know, contribute and, and start my career? And the reason for that are very obvious reasons. You know, while I, I showed all the powerful, um, you know, powerful leadership that we're seeing from Gen Z, and we are getting, I would say, just remarkable people who join Teach for America. There are also, you know, we're hearing very clear themes that folks are grappling with. You know, folks want more flexible schedules, so they're not sure that you know going into teaching in the classroom is something that they want. And so we've got to show there are ways to, you know, do this and, and meet your needs. Folks want to make sure that there's a way to really um, take care of the me their mental wellness. And that's a big priority for students and for adults and for young adults, all adults really, who are, you know, having to grapple with this. And so that's that's something that's on their mind and, and financial. You know, this is a generation that's that's graduating with the most debt of any generation. And so that's a big calculation for folks. And so our job, of course, is to say, how do we make, how do we create the conditions that allows folks to join? Um, but we see, have seen a decrease. We have incredible people still joining, obviously. Um, and we are working to ensure that, you know, we continue to inspire people to understand the moment we're in and how there is no greater active leadership than to join us um, and teach in this moment now more than ever. 
Yeah. So, and, and so how do you go about developing leaders um, within yeah. the community? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I'd say, you know, and in particular, as we focus on our Latinx leaders, which we're really proud, 20% of our teachers, our core members um, are Latinx. And that's really important because across the country, you know, 9% of all teachers um, identify as Latinx. And if, when you look at the student population in public schools, nearly 30% of kids are, you know, identify as Latinx. And we all know you can't be what you can't see. And there's enough research that says it really matters that kids see themselves in their teachers. And so this is a big priority for us. So I would name three things. The first thing is teaching is a great active development. And so we, you know, we support our teachers through that process um, as they, you know, face some incredible wins and, you know, are able to really see the, the fruits of their labor. And also we'll experience some really tough lows because teaching is hard, but it makes you stronger. It makes you resilient. It helps you really know what you're made of. And you have a whole community of people showing up and doing the same thing. So the whole act of just teaching their two years is an incredible um, leadership development experience that we nurture and is, is you know, the big part of our development. Um, and so that's one. The second thing that we do is we ensure that we're continuing to build the leadership of our, you know, alums. Um, and I know that you all support your communities and your members for executive and leadership roles in corporate America. And so we do the same, but in education. And so, you know, one focus area as an example is when you look at, um, you know, administrative roles within education, your superintendents, for example, only 3% of superintendents identify as Latinx. And so we know that's a huge gap. And so we are investing in our alums and in, in we created this aspiring Latinx Leadership Institute where we are ensuring that we are giving the development and partnership and, and you know, um, building the network of our folks in order for them to be competitive for those jobs because we know that's going to just lead to more progress. And then the third thing I would say is we partner with organizations such as Alpha, um, incredible organizations who are working to develop, you know, Latinx professionals and making a huge impact. And it would be impossible for us to be doing this alone. And so working together helps us all contribute and have it all add up to, to something bigger. Yeah, and I, I love the, the relationship that our organizations have. Um, it, it is fantastic. So now let me ask you this, for po folks that are, are listening to this and they are now getting excited about the potential for them to jump into something like this, what do you look for in corp members, what what is yeah. what makes a, a good candidate in your mind? Yeah, so um, we're looking for exceptional equity oriented leaders, and what that means to us, and the way we've come up with this is we've essentially we've studied our very best teachers in classrooms. We studied the mindsets, we studied the skills that folks have that makes them effective. We've also studied our alumni when we look at what our alums are doing in incredible leadership roles. And so we've come up, that's what makes up our selection model. It's a very rigorous model um, and it's, it's a high bar to entry. And this is a big part of our program is like really ensuring that we're selecting. And the reason we have such a high bar of, to entry is because we're teaching children, you know, of greatest need. And our promise is to ensure that we deliver the education our kids want and deserve, which is an excellent and equitable education. And so we are that is why we have to have a high bar to entry because we have to deliver for our kids. Um, but the things that we're looking for are things like, you know, bold leadership, the ability to set a big vision and pursue transformational results. And that you've sort of done that in your life, that you are a resilient person, that you are a learner, that you're reflective, you, you know, you, you work with others and you're able to reflect on your own self and how you contribute what your strengths are. Um, you know, how you are able to strengthen a team to get big things done. Um, we're looking for folks who are able to build strong relationships, you know, with others, are able to plan purposefully um, and just really go after transfer, transformational change in the things that, you know, one is pursuing. And so those are some of the things that we are looking for. And obviously you're joining a network of incredible and diverse folks who are coming from all over the country to pursue a single mission. 
Love that, right? Learners, resilient, bold, relationship oriented, going after change. I think you just described the Latino community, the Latinx community exactly. as a whole, right? So <laughs> it, it's we need more folks jumping in there. Now, as you prepare court members to go into the classroom, we talked a little bit earlier where it could get a little scary sometimes going yeah. into this world. Um, what's some of the preparation that happens um, for these leaders that jump in, have these qualities, how do you help them go into that that classroom confident and ready to go? Yeah. Um, so after folks go through our selection, our you know recruitment and selection process, we then have a robust you know two year program and then an, an alumni effort. And so we start with a training model that is you know um, virtual. It's virtual and it's in person. So there's both um, because you know that first year we weren't able to be teaching kids, but yeah. teaching kids to as a part of our training model is a very important part of our model. So we will have um, a virtual experience where we're able to provide the best in class training and support. And then also in practice, in context where folks are gonna be teaching as part of our model. And then we provide ongoing supports for two years. So we feel deeply responsible for ensuring that our core members, our teachers, get the impact that they signed up for with their children. Um, and so we are on the hook for supporting them with the resources, the connections that they need, and knowing that they're never alone, that they are part of a community showing up for kids every day. And so that's what folks can expect when, when they join us. Uh, that's fantastic. And I, I got to say, um, definitely admire. Um, I saw that when, when the pandemic happened, you guys opened up a Slack channel. You had a couple thousand alumni jump in, offer assistance on different things. It shows the type of individuals that are part of Teach for America and that their mission doesn't stop when they're done teaching. They still give back to the community. So it's a phenomenal network to engage with and enjoy. Um, you're obviously doing a great job. Your team is obviously doing a great job. So thank you for what you are doing. Um, now, as we start moving towards the end, I want to say for anybody watching, please, you can go ahead and ask some questions. We're going to save the last 10, 15 minutes or so for Q&A. Um, I want to talk about some questions that aren't necessarily Teach for America focused, but I think tie into why you are a great leader in your position. Um, I want to talk for a second about an open letter that you wrote last year. Um, mm. I had a chance to read it and I, it, it impacted me. Um, I'm going to read a little piece of it for okay. a second here. Um, it says, and this is, I'm quoting you, I talk often about the power of crucible moments, especially for young leaders. My advice has always been to seek out these experiences. A crucible breaks you and rebuilds you, strips you of your comfort and stretches your understanding of what you are capable of. It challenges your resolve and summons strengths you didn't know you had. Can you talk a little bit more about crucible moments and your your philosophy around running towards the hard things? Uh, so yeah, I just love to hear more about that. Yeah, I'm happy to. You know, my first crucible was what I described going to college. I didn't realize that's what I was in the middle of, but what I realize is, and I when my observation is it's so easy to pick things that are safe because you're comfortable, you know, you're more likely to succeed if you're doing something that you're, you're like, oh, I can predict how I will do that. What I've observed in myself, both like when I went to college and was just totally out of my element culturally and otherwise, and didn't realize how hard that would be, but also teaching also becoming the CEO of Teach for America or like every actual move. When I became an executive director at 25, right after teaching for three years, I ran my region locally in South Texas. And then I became the chief operating officer at the age of 29, overseeing this massive, the field, you know, and yeah. I, I didn't, I, 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 I didn't, I wasn't prepared for that. I don't, I didn't go to business school. I'm now the CEO of Teach for America. I've been in for seven years. So at every moment, it's like, can I do that? And I don't even call it imposter syndrome. Like, I, I don't think people, you know, fake it till you make it thing. It's, it's actually learning to believe in yourself and that you actually can do it. And, and you, and, and human beings rise to the occasion. You really understand humanity is incredible. We are a resilient people 
but it pushes you to start doing things. And the earlier you start to get into crucibles, the more you learn about yourself faster. I didn't know that I'm a highly adaptable person. And so the reason I wasn't overwhelmed by the cultural differences at DePa, which I didn't know this was a strength of mine, is I'm able to really process, I'm, I'm curious. I actually thrive being around people who are different than me. I didn't know that about myself. And I learned how to process things that are hard. When and yeah, I got, I, things were said that were very offensive to me and my culture and my background. And I learned early on how to deal with that and then how to stand powerfully in that. And, and, I, and I, I never would have had exposure to that. I learned how to do that at the age of 18. And I knew I learned that was a strength of mine that has served me well to understand that is a strength of mind. Um, and so those things emerge from these moments that you literally get broken down and then you believe so much in yourself. Like you're like, yeah, so on the one hand, teaching was really hard. I mean, I cried every day after my first year, at my first week of teaching every day. I just was in tears the first few weeks but I knew I wouldn't quit because I didn't quit. I had that 18 year old experience and I got broken down. <laughs> then I, I knew quitting wasn't even an option for me. And I felt so sure of that. It wasn't even top of mind. For a lot of my peers, this was their first moment of failure. It is hard. And so they got their crucible moment where they were stripped down. I got different crucibles and I learned a lot more about myself. I learned how to, that I could like galvanize groups of people to get things done. I learned how to, you know, how to understand people's interests and then how to connect dots. And that's I, truly teaching was my best preparation to become a CEO. Um, it really was because you learn how to communicate, how to set vision, how to use data, all these things that I didn't quite understand. And so I just urge people because people live their whole lives and never dive in and say, I'm drawn to this. I'm somehow passionate about it, but can I really contribute? I don't know if, I, if, if I'm prepared or ready to do it. And we see it, especially with women, we see it, especially with people of color, Latinx community. We're so humble and we tend to just, you know, really interrogate and be harder on ourselves than than we ought to be. And, and instead say, we have a knowledge and a wisdom and an understanding right. where we need more people leading with our values, with our way of approaching the work in a way that's collaborative and rooted in community and values driven um, and that's the kind of leadership we need. And so that that's where that comes from. And I deeply believe it. And and that's what you get when you join Teach for America or think of all these other things that folks just dive in, trust yourself and you will rise to the occasion and you will be forever changed as a result. Thank you for sharing that. I'll say this. So um, I want to also dive a little bit into um, the idea of authentic leadership values mm -hmm. Um, I've seen you speak multiple times. Um, I probably could write up your values based on having seen you. You seem to me to be someone that is the definition of an authentic leader. You're not a different person everywhere you go. You, you are you. How have you been able to stay that way given a pretty fast rise? Um, lots of, you know, sometimes you, you get... You, you, you get a certain amount of power too quick. It could change who you are. It could change how you act. Um, you seem to be pretty consistent in your empathy, your your engagements, your everything. How, um, yeah, how do you stay your authentic self throughout everything? Well, um, thank you for saying that because that's important to me to 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 stay rooted and and focus on that. I I will say my strategy when I'm feeling like I don't have my two feet on the ground or like I'm not sure where to go next, I go home. <laughs> I literally go back home to the Rio Grande Valley and I go and I I just get present with my family who keeps me very rooted. Um, you know, I, I come from humble beginnings and I know I'm highly privileged and, and have power and all the things. And I want to just be true to who I am and where I come from. And that's really important to me. And so I'll say that that's my strategy. And in my toughest professional moments in the last years have been very tough for many different reasons and our ability to have to pivot and all, all the things that get thrown at any leader in this moment and all of us as, as human beings, um, I, I travel home. And that is when I'm able to get my clarity, be really rooted and really find the 
inner wisdom and, and my inner strength of, of who I am. And so that I encourage folks to figure out what that is for you. But for me, that's that's the thing that um, I do. And spending time with my siblings who are very real with me <laughs> <I'm pretty rooted. laughs> it's a very important thing well. keep, keep you humble yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> now do you do you do you have a a personal board of directors not your board of directors, but like a personal one that you kind of keep around also that you're able to tap into in different moments i do i i do and i think that's really important for everyone to have folks that like really know you um, and know your values and can just look at you in the eyes and say all the things, say the hard things, say the real things and encourage you and do it in a way that, you know, is rooted and, and coming from a place of love is the most important thing. And so um, absolutely. And, you know, finding who your sponsors are, not people who like uh, prop you up, but people who really believe in you and are going to stand by you and support you um, at every step of the way professionally and in your networks and their networks has been really important to that I've discovered as I've you know been on, on my journey. Uh, and, and so so one more piece before we start to, to round out. Um, early on, you talked about how you were able to ask for help. You were able to ask for support. It's something that I know for myself, it, it's not the easiest thing to do. Um, and a lot of folks I took th that asking for help, sometimes it, yeah. it's very hard. How did you learn that not only is it okay to ask for support, but that it's actually good idea to ask for support, uh, being able to move on things. How did you get yourself there? Yeah. It might have been a moment of desperation, David, honestly, <laughs> because what I realized, and actually it served me well, I look for, I think one of the most important leadership qualities are in people who know how to ask for help. Because what it teaches you, what I learned, I, I learned how to do this my freshman year in, in college, my first semester, because I truly was doing everything I needed to do and it wasn't quite working. It wasn't getting me to where I needed to go. And so I, and so the fear is that people see you as inadequate. The fear is that people see you as weak. You know, the fear is that you're not good enough, but that's the story we tell ourselves. And that is, that, that's like, that is blocking. We're in our own way when we let that story win, because in fact, what I've learned is people see strength when I ask for help, because I know what I know. And I am standing from a position of strength when I ask you for help, because in order for me and us to get done what we need to get done, it takes it takes all of us. Like no one can do this alone. This work is too hard, too complex. And anyone that actually thinks they can do it, I'm like run from that person because that is a scary person. And 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 you know and and there is strength in understanding and and being able to stand in what you don't know and where you need help. Um, but also, you also know what you're good at and what you do stand firmly in. And so, I encourage folks to really lean into that. And, and when you're able to stand and come to it from a position of conviction and strength, you're, you just get more powerful in that moment. Yeah. I, I love that. Right. Um, where I've been able to get to in my head is you know, the whole idea of fake it to you make it type stuff is less about pretending, you know, and trying to get it done and more about having confidence That's in right. yourself to be able to get it done with engaging the right way. And so sometimes that's finding someone that knows about it more than you. Sometimes it's, 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 you know, pulling a whole team of folks together to make sure you're divvying out things the right way. Sometimes it's taking what you know how to do and giving it to somebody else to do so that they can have a learning opportunity while you're bridging for your next thing as well. So there's so much to it. Um, I love how you described it. And I think it's one of the most important things that we can do is knowing that it's okay to ask for support. As we start to wind down, last couple of minutes over here, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of circle back on for folks that want to engage with uh, Teach for America, folks that want to join. Um, can you talk one more time about how you can join? Yes. Um, for those of you interested in learning more and joining us, please visit our website at www.teachforamerica.org. And in there, you'll get information about how to apply our deadlines. You get more information about the communities where we partner and serve. Um, and you can start to explore all of that on our website and then ways to get in communication with us locally, nationally, et cetera. 
Awesome. And I would assume that even if you're not thinking about uh, joining from a standpoint of um, you're already someplace in your career where you're not wanting to do that, but you want to be a part of the mission. You want to be yes. a part of the change that is going to happen across this country because of the Teach for America uh, organization. You go to the same website, I would assume, yes. to be able to find ways that you can engage. That's right. Yeah, that's the way to do it. Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Elisa, for being a part of this conversation. I encourage everybody to, to follow Elisa on LinkedIn, follow Teach for America on LinkedIn, on social media. Yes. This is a fantastic organization. Um, as Jenny is saying over here, such an influential Latina. So honored to hear your story. I agree. Thank you so much, Elisa, for everything. And we will close out our show for today. Truly appreciate you taking the time with us. Thank you. Take good care. Thanks for all you all do. You all are doing incredible work and it's an honor to be a part of it. Thank you. All right. Take good care. <laughs>